Welcome to Theology Thursday, an ecumenical space for students to discuss matters of faith and theology. I'm your host, Connor Grubbs, and after last week's train wreck, we have since fired Johnny and Ryan, and they will never be allowed on the podcast again. I'm just kidding. They'll be back next week, but we do have a very, very special guest this week, probably the most special of all the guests we've had thus far, Mariah Baker. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, this is my girlfriend, and Hi. I'm very honored to have her on the show today. So it's going to be the most adorable episode yet. Um, but this true. this is something that we had talked about um, for a while now, is like talking about science and faith and how those things intersect. And we kind of even touched on it in our apologetics series. Um, and as we're coming to a close of the season, wanted to have a few more guests on. So welcome. Thank you for being Thanks. on the show today. My honor. <laughs> but this season has been, the guests that we've had come on, yes, we're tackling different theological topics, but really it's more about testimony. And what I think is cool about today's episode is that while, yes, we are going to talk about how do science and faith overlap and connect, it really is more about your personal faith journey and yeah. your testimony mm-hmm. and how discovering those things was such a big part of your yeah. journey to faith. So um, really excited about that. A couple things I want to premise it with. One, this will probably be the last episode of Theology Thursday because if you listen to the show, you already know that me and Johnny and Ryan are idiots. Um, <laughs> in fact, that's probably why you listen to the show is to watch us slowly destroy our own careers. But... Um, If you didn't realize it yet, this episode will highlight just how stupid we are because (laughs) (laughs) Mariah is a genius. No. And you'll see that today. Sure. Don't don't be modest. She's smarter than all three of us combined. So, like, if you thought that, like, anything we've ever talked about was, like, too complicated, then you might as well tap out because this is next level stuff right here. Um... (laughs) Before we get into it, though, I do want to talk about how um, science, and this is something we touched on in the apologetics thing, science can't be used to prove God's existence. And I think when you discuss how science and the Bible relate and how science and faith relate, um, it can be a great discussion, and I think it helps deepen our um, appreciation for God and his design and his sovereignty. Yeah. However... I think it's a poor tool to try to use to convert somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, And I wish I knew the name of the guy who said this. I should have written it down. But I I heard a speaker recently talking about how using science to prove a philosophical, you know, trying to use science, the academic discipline of science, to prove a philosophical question is like trying to use a spatula to fix a car. It's (laughs) like the wrong tool. Like, it just doesn't really work. So... I think it's still fine to talk about these things and study these things, and it can strengthen and deepen your faith, but it shouldn't be the basis of it. Right. Because nothing about our faith in Christ can be proven with using the scientific method. So, like, that cannot be your basis. It's, I think, rather a tool and something that can go along with yeah. your faith. And I think it's good to, like, just point out, too, that I was already saved, and that's kind of part of my testimony I'm going to talk about is that I knew Christ before I knew all of this stuff. This just kind of solidified everything and deepened my understanding um, rather than, oh, okay, that makes sense. Like, here's a good scientific argument, so therefore I believe God exists. It was after the fact. Right, and I think it can help aid us when we're talking to people who maybe maybe they don't believe in six-day creation. Maybe they believe in theistic evolution. Well, as long as they're saying that God created the universe... um, and that it was perfect, and that man brought sin into the world, and they're accepting, you know, the rest of the Bible. I personally am a six-day creationist. I think if you study the Bible properly, if you look at science, it adds up. It makes sense. But I'm not going to say that somebody who's accepted Christ, who is a theistic evolutionist, that their salvation isn't valid just because they believe God used evolution to do creation. Right, yeah, and I wouldn't say that their salvation isn't, you know, there. Right. Um, And definitely for me... It, that's kind of part of what I'm going to talk about too is that I tried to bring the two together and that was uh, 
a lot of time that I spent researching and just diving more into the word and, and realizing things that really strengthened my faith. Yeah. Then, so. But I think it's just good to know when you're having those conversations with people that, you know, they may not have all the answers. They may mm-hmm. not agree with you on everything scientifically, but that doesn't mean that's not the gospel. Right. Right. And, and, we, are, and no one was there right. at the beginning of the universe. So we can't say with one clear cut answer, like, this is how it is. And, you know, this right. is how it happened. <laughs> and I think often these conversations, depending on the person, are better had, you know, amongst believers. Mm-hmm. It, it, because trying to use this to convert somebody, like I've already said, it isn't going to work. Because you can, you can win the argument and lose the person. Yeah. And that's something we talked about in our apologetic series. But uh, just kind of share personally, like, your testimony, how studying these scientific things strengthened your faith and, and, and where this all started. Yeah, so uh, 1999, no, I'm just kidding. Oh, wow, we're going back to the very <laughs> no. beginning. Um, so really, uh, just kind of going back, like I said, I was saved at six years old. I knew what I was doing, but I didn't understand, like, all the implications I would have in my life. That wasn't until I was about 13 years old, and I really just started thinking about things, and my faith was becoming my own, and it wasn't rooted in my family being Christians. It was you know, rooted in, okay, like, yeah, <laughs> this makes sense. And and God, of course, saved me. Um, and then after that point, that's when I was in eighth and ninth grade, and I was taking earth-based science, and that's when I fell in love with astronomy, um, just being introduced to that and, like, the different sizes of the planets and the size of the sun and everything and those comparisons. That's when I realized, like, huh, okay, this is pretty cool. But there's never that moment where my faith was really being tested. So it's still very easy for me to just kind of continue and learning science and then being a Christian and, okay, yeah, I can study planetary motions and sizes and that won't interfere with anything. So it really wasn't until I started college um, at 15 years old because I started dual enrollment and I knew that I wanted to take astronomy because I loved it so much in eighth and ninth grade. But in order to take any science classes, I had to pass my math classes, and I was terrible at math. I had actually been held behind in eighth grade math. I was going to have to take that again. So not only was I terrible in it, I hated it and wanted nothing to do with it. I can relate. <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel most people can. Um, and it, it comes down a lot to just, like, confusion and, you know, not being able to understand it. But... Then I studied all summer for four months, crying in my room, (laughs) trying to learn all this math so I could pass my um, entrance exam, so I could take my science classes and just take the two math classes I need to, uh, to get my degree done. So I did, and God honored that hard work of studying and blessed me and helped me actually appreciate math at that point and really start to enjoy it. And then I saw, like, the connection between math and science. And I love that. Yeah. I want to highlight something you said for our high school and middle school students mm-hmm. who listen to this podcast. She said that God honored her hard work studying, meaning you cannot pray that you'll pass the <laughs> exam and not study for it and then right. be mad that you failed. Right. you you got to put in the work, too. Yes. Although prayer is a big part of it. Absolutely. And we saw that with calculus, too, yes. <laughs> getting through that whole class. Um, so, yeah, just don't rely solely on that. You also have a responsibility. You've got to put study. the hard work in, and then he blesses that. Right, um, which you've done really every semester since. <laughs> every semester, yeah. I'm now completed in my fifth college-level math class. Never thought I would say that. I, I just, never will say that. <laughs> I just wanted the two for the degree, and then it would be over and never look at another math problem. I don't want any of them. Ever again. <laughs> um, so that's just a little practical application. Yeah, right? and then ironically, I know you already know this, but for listeners, I'm now becoming a mathematics um, educator for high school. <laughs> Which I love that part of your story, that like you hated yeah. math. and it hated was, it. And you have since discovered that, wait, if I, somebody who you know, in eighth grade, wasn't even entirely sure what a fraction, like, how that worked. (laughs) (laughs) Up until I was 16 years old, I didn't understand. Can learn 
calculus too, then anybody can learn it. Yes, and, and it that's a became, huge, a huge yeah. thing for me. Like part of my testimony is just encouraging other people. Like, you know, I'm not this person who just always loved math and understood it and got involved and now I'm going to be a math teacher and oh yeah, I'm super smart. Like I always say, I'm really stupid and I shouldn't You're say not. it, but, I, but I'm always like, you don't understand. It was terrible. Um, so yeah, God definitely blessed him. He had a plan and I think he used astronomy to bring me to that point too, because going back to what I was saying, the two interrelate, you can't disconnect science from math. Um, they work with each other and to explain a lot of things that you are observing in astronomy, you need math to do it. Um, and a lot of theoretical stuff is based primarily in math and doesn't have any observational side to it. So pretty interesting thing. And math is an absolute. Um, science is, of course, we have the theoretical side. So things that are not laws, things that cannot be 100% proven, whereas with math, it exists, it is. <laughs> So yeah, that was just around the time like getting into math and uh, starting to appreciate the beauty behind it and everything. So it was really when I started my astronomy classes, since I got past all of that and began math and everything, that that's when my faith was really tested. I was being presented with things I'd never been presented with. Um, the Big Bang was the number one thing because we were doing a lot of projects around it and we were using a lot of the math that's involved in in that to prove different things and for me hearing the big bang was always like a taboo subject growing up christian you hear that and you're like oh well that's wrong let me never look at that <laughs> you know um but since i was doing so much work in it and surrounding it i had to really like think about it um this was also the time that i was meeting a lot of atheists I usually only had like Christian youth group friends, so it was never really an issue, never presented with questions before like this, but I was asked, um, the one that you know, were there ants that went on the ark? Or uh, that there's trees older than 6,000 years? Um, and then which, of course, we found out is not the case, that the oldest is like 4,845 years old. <laughs> so were there ants on the ark? I think there was. <laughs> I mean... They didn't address that in A Bug's Life. I know. It, it's unfortunate, but it is a fact, you know. Okay. <laughs> I didn't see it in the Russell Crowe movie either, but... Right, right. That's fine. They didn't really emphasize all the insects... The important parts. ...going the on the arc. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, just the rock monsters. So, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, but having atheists kind of, like, throw these questions at you. Yeah. Me. And things that I had just honestly never thought about before. I was totally safe in my little Sunday school kind of stories like, oh, two giraffes, two lions. You see them walking onto the ark and the cartoon drawing, and that's all I knew. Um, so I was really saying a lot like, oh, well, just faith. Like, I go on faith. And that's not to discredit faith because, of course, <laughs> that's the whole thing of our salvation, you know. Um, it, But it was just I felt ignorant, you know, and I felt like they were discrediting everything I believed and it was really shaking my faith. You wouldn't think like, oh, we're ants on the ark, that that's faith shaking, but it was because I wasn't studied um, on anything really. So after that, I tried to, just because I was like in that point, I was trying to marry the Big Bang and all of these other um, scientific thoughts with scripture, with the Bible and saying like well it's okay like I can have faith and then I can also believe in in science too um so everything for me kind of changed when two things happened um the first one a person at my church had actually told me about a guy by the name of Jason Lyle and I think I've told you about him before um and he did a lecture on something called fractals which is where you kind of like, if you think about a triangle having a shape, and then you build more triangles on that, and then more on those. Illuminati and confirmed. Yeah, yeah, the Illuminati confirmed. <laughs> no, but um, it's the replication of shapes, but on a smaller scale. So he went through that, and he talked about the Mandelbrot set, which is just basically it's this equation in math, and when you add numbers to it and you do the math, you get certain points that are in the set, and certain points that are not in the set. And if you graph that on a computer, 
you get this infinite shape, which mathematicians named the Mandelbrot. <laughs> Um, and what's so significant about this shape is, one, it was not invented, it was not created by any mathematician. Uh, it was discovered in the 70s, and it's a common pattern that you see in the very small and the very large in the universe. So if you look at the shape of a snowflake, and then you look at the shape of a galaxy, you see this common pattern. Mm. Um, so really, for me, hearing this and just seeing the math behind it and everything, it almost, it showed me this is just one of many of God's original blueprints for the universe. Right. It showed a common creator, a common design um, in the very large and very small. And within the human body. I don't know much about anatomy, but <laughs> um, there's a lot of things relating to cells and stuff. So that was with Jason Lyle. Um, and I was also learning that math was an absolute and that it was really God's language too because if he's giving us these blueprints, allowing us to study them and see them, you know, we're learning more about the language he uses in nature and everything behind that. So the second thing was uh, visiting the Creation Museum and the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, which I would recommend everyone <laughs> see that if they can go to Kentucky. Um, and it's my favorite place in the United States. But for me, going there was just a family vacation, honestly. It was just, okay, yeah, I graduated high school, no big deal. We're going to go do something Christian. How much fun, you know? Um, and then once I got there and just seeing all the evidence, seeing all the biblical aspects of it relating to science, it kind of was like, okay, I surrender. <laughs> you know, that moment like with Case for Christ where it was just such an overwhelming amount of facts and proofs and evidence that I just had to come to a point that all those stories I was thinking of that were the foundation of my faith, like the right. Sunday school stuff, really could be proven, really were true. It, it made it real for me going mm. there. Um, so it opened my eyes to a lot of scripture that was backed by science. Um, we don't typically think of that, but every fact where it was in the physical, not the supernatural, in the scripture, is supported by science, a scientific theory, or mathematical proof. Uh, you can go through with each one and, and work that out and see that. So the main thing was, it wasn't that I was stupid. It wasn't that Christians can only say, oh, faith, when people present questions. Right. But it was that I just had to study right. this stuff in the scripture. It was right there. Yeah. God gave it to us. So when I came home, that's really when I started to study everything. And I was kind of like fired up after going to the Creation Museum and like, okay, I can do this. I can, you know, find answers and everything. Um, and just like a little side note too, God, we humans invented the study, the academic study of science. You know, we have the scientific method and we say this is how science should be done, this is how theories are deemed, you know, the way they are. But in reality, the laws, the driving force behind everything that science is, are things that God created and set in motion. It goes back to that blueprint of math. It goes back to um, the way things work in the universe, the physical laws. He set those into motion. Doesn't mean he used those during the creation week. A lot of things that we see were supernatural and can't be explained with the laws he bound us by. But we, we work in those, just like God is not bound by time, and time is a fourth dimension for us. He, he created time for us to live in. Right. Um, so, yeah, just starting to study and everything. Um, I think the most foundational thing for me, and I, I kind of mentioned it earlier, was the Big Bang, was me bringing those two things together and trying to make them work. And what you see, this is kind of like the science-y side of stuff, <laughs> if you want the scientific facts and everything. Um, the Big Bang is thought to be a extremely hot, extremely dense singularity. Scientists don't know what a singularity is. They, if you ask any scientists they'll say, well, it's a singularity. <laughs> That's what it means. There's, there's no meaning behind it. Um, it's an infinitesimally small point. And if you think about the word infinite, 
That's not a number. <laughs> Infinity stones. Infinity stones. See, this they all relates to Avengers. They called them singularities, too. Yeah, yeah. Because, well, see, those are physical objects. <laughs> this, their concept behind it is they're giving a definition, they're giving a name to something that is just a concept. It's not a physical object. Um, but, yeah, you think about the word infinite, and if something is infinitesimally small... It means it doesn't exist. Right. <laughs> like you're just putting a name on on nothing. Um, so that part, that's really when I thought, okay, yeah, that makes sense. And it's backed up by scripture too, um, because we see in Jeremiah Jeremiah fifty one fifteen, it is he who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, and by his understanding stretched out the heavens. So the Big Bang's main premise is this infinitesimally small nothing expanded rapidly into everything and created the, um, the atoms, the particles, the things that made the stars, the things that made the planets, all of that. So that's, yeah, that's backed up. You know, that's evidence of things that we can see. Um, and then also Hebrews 11.3 that by faith we understand, and faith, see, I thought that was cool the first time I heard that. Uh, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So again, he spoke the world into existence. He created everything from nothing. So that's how it kind of overlapped, and you're seeing, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense, the Big Bang. So really when it kind of started to fall apart for me and, and going to the Creation Museum was the time scales and the differences between the two. And it was how with the Big Bang model, you're getting, okay, this expansion of the universe, then uh, you get stars, and then after you get stars, you get planets from the stellar disk of gas and dust. The planets are then places of hell and <laughs> fire and just extremely hot and they eventually cool down, you eventually get water, then you get, you know, microscopic organisms that evolve into fish and then other animals and it continues on that time scale. And then we see in the scripture, well, actually the very first thing was planet Earth uh, covered in water and light existed before the sun. So God had created light <laughs> and yet we didn't have a star yet, we didn't have the sun or the moon or anything. Um, and then we see that plants are made on the third day, and then on the fourth day we get the sun. Well, we know that plants need light to survive, so everything kind of seemed backwards and contrary, and I thought, well, maybe, like, God just got it, like, poetically wrong, or, you know, maybe the writers in Genesis and all this, it was just kind of mixed up because they didn't have scientific understanding back then. But then when you think about the supernatural aspects of it and how God did things a certain way you know that was that's just how he did it right supernatural and also the fact that that was a very different world than the one we live in now i mean yeah. god's light god's presence was there because that was before Absolutely. sin entered the world mm -hmm. yeah he is light <laughs> um There's but that's not gonna be a sun in heaven right in eternity we're told that because his presence will be the light that we need. So yeah. that's that's kind of what, what comes to mind when I'm hearing that. Yeah, and I think in Revelation, too, it talks about um, the heavens being rolled up like a scroll. And that's actually very consistent with either Stephen Hawking or Einstein's theory of the end of the universe. There's three different kinds, but one is it falling back in on itself. Um, so that is, again, another thing supported by science. Oh, and just to, to note, too, in Jeremiah... That was written in about 600 BC, and we know um, it's talking again about how God stretched out the heavens with his hands and expands the universe. Yet we did not know that in the scientific community until 1929 when Edwin Hubble really studied through, looking through the telescope and seeing a redshift is what it's called, um, where on the light spectrum you see how light is turning more red, and that means something's moving away. It turns more blue if something is moving towards us. So when you do the math and everything behind it, it just proves that space itself is expanding out. So in Jeremiah, they knew that long before any scientific evidence supported it. So then really, I would say uh, the biggest part of where it really started to fall apart 
aside from, you know, the time scales being different and everything, I still was thinking maybe it was just wrong in Genesis, um, was the secular scientific community saying it was wrong. <laughs> um, for the first time hearing it outside of astronomy class, because in class they were kind of presenting it more as um, a fact rather than a theory, though they did say it was a theory. It was like, this is the leading theory and we need to do all of our other stuff from this foundation. And um, for me, it was two things <laughs> the, that are super scientific, but it was the cosmic microwave background is what it's called, and inflation theory. And with the cosmic microwave background, that's just a big long explanation for scientists who in, I believe it was 1963, looked out into space um, with X-ray telescopes and were able to see a consistent radiation if you look as far to the left and as far to the right in space, it was consistent and there was radiation left from the Big Bang, what they would say. Um, this I want is cosmic actually. Microwave. That I, sounds like it could make some pretty intense snacks. It can make some really good pizza rolls. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, no. But um, so, anyways, this cosmic microwave background, though, actually disproves the Big Bang theory even though they say it, it proves it, because you can't have consistency on either side of the universe with the original model of the Big Bang. If everything expanded out at the speed it did, it would have never had time to interact the left and right with each other to be perfectly consistent. It's kind of like pouring creamer and coffee. You get this swirl and everything mixes well together. So inflation theory in the 70s, a man came up with a mathematical model um, there's absolutely no observational proof of it, <laughs> but he said, well, during the expansion, it expanded even more rapidly, uh, gave everything enough time to interact, and then just magically slowed back down, and it continued in the way, you know, we understand the Big Bang. And I was like, okay, <laughs> isn't, like, the point of science to be as simple, as concise as we can make it? and to follow the scientific method. And if something has to be supported by a crutch, basically of, well, here's how we can fix it, then you should trash the whole model and find something that's better. So that's when I really just realized like, okay, yeah, <laughs> this doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, so that kind of led me to another point in my life where I was just understanding biblical science for the first time and saying like, we can do science, we can understand science from a biblical perspective. Um, and Christians, I'd encourage like young people definitely to study these things because uh, for any of the listeners that are in high school or middle school, you may be encountering these sciences for the first time and you'd never want to just take something as fact. Because even though it's in a textbook, even though it's coming from a professor's mouth, it doesn't mean they're right. Right. And if you and something I was telling you, Connor, personally was uh, with them discovering or taking the first image of the black hole two and a half years ago, we were told in our astronomy class that was impossible. And now it's here. Right. <laughs> like it's possible. So things are always changing and you should always study it and never just take it at face value. Well, yeah. And, and science, so like you said, science is always changing. And, and at the end of the day, even the scientific method isn't foolproof. We came up with that. Right. So mm -hmm. no matter which way you go, whether you decide to not believe in God or to believe in God, there is an amount of faith that yeah. comes with that. Absolutely. You know, people like to say atheism isn't a religion. It's it's non-religion. <laughs> but that's there's a lot of faith in yeah. saying that, you know, the Big Bang did happen. And that's how it mm -hmm. all started. So you don't eliminate faith by choosing not to believe in God. Right. You're just choosing to have faith in something else. Right, yeah. And that's ultimately what it came down for, like for me, was to see, okay, if you are looking back at the Big Bang and it, it, just forget about that, forget about Genesis for a second, that's just all say, you know, every human on this planet Earth who is capable of rational thought can agree that there was a beginning of the universe. That's been well proven by this point, you know. Um, Einstein actually did a lot of work in proving that, that the universe is finite, it's not infinite, so we know it had a beginning. Because if you reverse time, you reverse everything expanding out, it'll come down to a single point of 
beginning. So now you're going to either believe that nothing created everything for absolutely no reason, everything is an accident, everything is happenstance, or you're going to believe that someone created everything out of nothing. <laughs> right. Um, and for me, that was like, okay, God, you know, yeah, mm. that makes sense. Um, and we should be good stewards of that information. And we should really take that to heart. And we should study these things because God put them there for us. You know, he could have said in the daytime, we look up at the sky and all we see is blue and we see clouds. And then at night, he could have made it completely black and completely starless. And we would never feel the need to look out and beyond but we can, and we can see these spiral galaxies, millions of them, which contain trillions of stars, and who knows how many planets are on each of those stars. Um, or we look out and we see these crazy different shaped planets and different elements, and we're discovering new things all the time with space exploration. He didn't allow, have to allow us to see any of that. That was by his grace, um, and it's to really declare his glory and everything and, and to help us know, one, more about him, and to build up our relationship with him and see who he is as creator God, but also teaches us more about ourself and our future and past and present. Um, so that's why I feel like it's, it's a Christian's responsibility almost to study these things because he gave them to us. Um, and then, yeah, just coming back to that point of you're going to do science, no matter how you do science, it's going to be from one of two points. It's either going to be that there are spiritual forces, a spiritual force, a God, whatever religion you want to tack on to that. Um, and then for the Christian, of course, you know, it was God, Yahweh. Or you're going to come from the point that there is no God. There's no spiritual force involved in, in the creation of the universe. Um, so you can't say, I'm doing science, you know, in an unbiased way. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not coming from any op opinion, any standpoint, but you are. You're, you're forming all of your conclusions based on the fact that everything was an accident. Um, so, yeah. And then for me, really, too, the other thing is just at the end of the day, like apart from every argument, apart from every logical conclusion you could come to, the very fact that God before he existed, before the universe existed, we know that. He exists outside of time. He exists outside of physical limitations, physical laws that he created for us. And if you could just imagine a universe not existing, you know, everything we see and understand is within the universe. And even still, he looked into the future, he knew, he's all-knowing, that he was going to create the universe, he was going to create our solar system, planet Earth, humans on planet earth and that he was going to give us free will in the garden adam and eve were going to sin they're going to make the choice and that he would still come down in the form of us as a human would age for 33 years and then would suffer and die on a cross just to save us and he chose to do that even knowing that information beforehand that shows me his grace and his mercy and love um, and I don't think you can compare that to anything else. That's the most powerful idea. Um, so yeah, that was that was my testimony. Thank you for <laughs> everything. Sharing. Yeah. Um, now I know what you're all thinking. How much are you paying her, Connor? Like, I, there's <laughs> no. no way that she would actually date you. How did you find somebody <laughs> this smart and trick them into like, what have you not told her yet? Look, I don't know. But she's decided to settle, and I'm not going to complain <laughs> about it. Um, but to drive the idea home of the, you know, th th that science can be a tool in strengthening our faith, but not something that can be used to convert somebody or, or mm -hmm. really lead to that point of salvation. Um, I had a friend in high school who was a skeptic, and I remember we would talk about things very similar to what you, all the things you just talked about. And he just stopped me one day, and he said... Now, Connor, that's that's not really the issue for me," he said. "If if the God that you're talking about is real, uh, then all the things that I've read about in the Bible that seem like they can't be scientifically explained, mm -hmm. He's capable of doing because He's an all-powerful, 
supernatural being. He said, that's not the problem. The problem is I've never heard his voice. This was mm-hmm. somebody who was really seeking, who really yeah. wanted a relationship with God. And at the end of the day, it wasn't a scientific argument that was going to win mm-hmm. him over. And at the end of the day, I shared my testimony on the podcast before. It wasn't a logical argument that was yeah. going to win me over. It was a faith thing. But I think this is really encouraging to show how if you are a Christian and you haven't studied these things, it can really build and strengthen your Absolutely. faith if you're willing to go on that journey. Mm-hmm. And we always talk about on the podcast, we're really just scratching the surface here. If you, these are things you want to pursue further, mm-hmm. um, uh, there's a couple resources you mentioned. Jason yes. Lyle, he's got all sorts of lectures on YouTube and things you can find and answers. Yeah. And Genesis has all sorts of resources and as well. the Institute for Creation Research is actually where Jason Lyle was the former uh, director. And he is a astrophysicist who took physics and mathematics um, in college, has a doctorate, and he happens to be a Christian. I always say that. He's not a Christian who, you know, does science and is just kind of not entirely credible. Like, he is a scientist with a doctorate and proves these things mathematically. Yes. And it's awesome. And one of the things, I hope that this episode has been just as much of a blessing to our listeners as your testimony has been to me because I remember one of the first times that we ever spent time together a spontaneous do you want to go to Chick-fil-A <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> and you said yes um, reluctantly <laughs> uh, yeah. you told me all a lot of the stuff that uh-huh. we just talked about on the podcast and it was just you were so open about it and, and excited about it and passionate about it yeah and I, I hate science, and I hate math, and none of it makes <laughs> sense to me. Hurts my heart a little bit, but... <laughs> and, and none of it makes sense to me, but the way that you explained it made it interesting. Yeah. And yes, there's a little bit of bias, but <laughs> um, I think for anybody, the fact that you're passionate about it and that it's actually a personal part of your story, it really, even if you aren't into science and math, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it's encouraging to hear all this, yeah. and I think you do a good job of explaining it in Thank a way you. that makes sense, because if I understood it, which for the most part I did, <laughs> then I, pretty much anybody can understand it. So, okay, yes. so good job. And Thank she was you. very, very nervous about being on the show I was. Today, <laughs> which is like she mentioned like not feeling worthy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Have you listened to this show? We're a bunch of, we're a bunch of buffoons. No. I, um, but she felt very nervous about it. So leave lots of comments telling her how <laughs> wonderful she is so that next week I can read them all to her. Okay, <laughs> sure. So just drop all of those in the comments, and um, we will be back next week. Me, Johnny, and Ryan, we are going to deconstruct everything that Ryan has believed his entire life <laughs> and try and convert him from being a Presbyterian. Because Presbyterians aren't Christians. To a Baptist. Yeah. That's our goal. So we'll see how that all goes down <laughs> on next week's episode of Theology Thursday. As always, thank you for listening to Theology Thursday. You can find old episodes on iTunes, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, YouTube, and Podbean. You can send questions that you want us to answer on the show to theologythursdaypodcast at gmail.com, and you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook. We hope to have you back next Thursday.